thank you again for being here for this uh, seminar, for this periodic seminar. Today we have um, Jose, who, is, who, who will be talking about the multi DAG model for real time parallel uh, for real time system of parallel application with transitional execution. I added something. So. Now you have 45 minutes to enter. 45? Yes, 45 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you want. <laughs> okay, so as Patrick uh, says, I'm going to talk about um, the scalability of parallel application with conditional execution. This is a paper that got accepted at the uh, SAC and I'm going to present in a few weeks. So, as you may know, uh, parallel tasks are what topic in real-time systems, um, mainly because there is like a shift towards the use of multi-core and many-core platforms <coughs> that allows uh, tasks with uh, high performance requirements uh, to be scheduled on these new platforms and so on. So to face this um, new challenge, uh, there has been a couple of parallel task models uh, that have been made available in the real-time literature, namely the fork join model, the synchronous parallel task model, and like the general DAG model. The models itself, they just differ on some restrictions that they um, impose on the synchronization points of the parallelism and so on. But for this presentation, it doesn't matter that much because what you are talking about is um, parallel tasks that have conditional statements like uh, if and else conditions and so on. And what this model, current models, we don't account for is this conditional execution. So basically, they assume that you have some nodes, some parts of your computation. So let's say that you start with um, a sequential execution, then forks in uh, two pieces and then synchronize in the end. They represent these nodes that must execute every time the application runs. So they don't account for any if then else condition. Everything in the day has to execute. And it's very unlikely that um, um, application for industry and so on, like a real application, uh, will not have any kind of conditional statement. So let's just Take an example, so here we have some open MP codes of a very simple application that basically starts with a call to a function A and then you have this if condition, if x is um, higher than 1 then I will run this loop 4 times, it will execute B for 4 times. If the condition is not satisfied then you enter the else condition and you run the function C 2 times. And then we have a function B that is common to, to both parts. Okay? So when this application runs, and each run of the application we call a job in real-time system, so for each one of the jobs, two different things may happen. So the application can enter this if clause, and then you have this DAG, which starts with the nodes of A, let's say that this is the worst case execution time of the nodes so it starts with the node A and then it forks four times B and it synchronizes on D this is one the if path of the application another thing may happen in a different run of the application so it goes for the else clause and we have a different tag, the else path that goes in A then to uh, nodes of C and synchronized in D. So here you can clearly see that there are two different decks of the application that can happen uh, on each instance of the task. These two paths are mutually exclusive. They can never happen together. So if one happens, the other one will not occur. So how would these current parallel models model this kind of application if they don't consider any kind of conditional execution? So one possibility to make the application work is to bring together the if and the else pair. 
So basically, we just merge the, the two tags and we come up with a conjunction which is the four nodes of E and four nodes of C that can never happen at the same time. Of course, this is a uh, over provisioning of the, um, of the model itself and brings a lot of pessimism when we come back to the analysis. So instead, in this paper, he presents like the first model to address explicitly the parallel applications that have conditional execution. And in this model, each task uh, is composed by a set of execution flows. And an execution flow is precisely one of these paths throughout the, the task scope. So in that case, you will have, for that application, that example, you will have just two different tags. And in the tag, you have the, the nodes, which he calls subtasks, that are the computational units, and you have direct edge connecting other nodes, meaning that these four nodes can only, they only become ready for execution when this node completes. Uh, its execution. Additional, it defines some parameters like the workload uh, of the DAG, that is the sum of all its nodes, the number of, um, of nodes in, the, in each one of the, of the DAGs, and the critical path length, which is basically the, the longest path in the, in the DAG. So based on these, um, on these three execution flows of one task, uh, I will show you why it's, uh, it's important to, um, to consider these different execution flows and not just a single one. With parallel execution, there is uh, a scheduling issue when you have this conditional execution. So let's say that you have uh, a task one which is composed by these three execution uh, flows. And you have a, sec a second task, which is just a special task with an execution time of uh, five time units. And let's also assume that the priority is that T1 is uh, higher than T2. So a potential schedule when we consider a platform of two cores would result in these diagrams. So you start executing uh, the execution flow of the first task, then it, there is here a gap, so we start executing the special task and so on. So just drawing the, the diagrams and you can observe that for the special task, the one uh, that yields the worst case response time is the third one with uh, 11 time units, which also happens to be the worst case uh, diagram for the, the third execution flow with 12 time units. Now, if instead of having two cores, you have an extra core, the scenario that leads to the worst case execution time of the, these tasks is not the same. Scenarios changes. So, if you draw a potential schedule for these tasks, assuming that they have synchronous release, you can observe that for uh, the first task, the worst case scenario happens in for execution flow two, and for the sequential task, it happens on the first scenario. So, depending on the configuration of the system, we can, say, we can talk about cores, priorities, task periods, and so on, there are different uh, execution flows that will lead to different worst case scenarios for the tasks that are part of our system. So, it's not always the same execution flow. 
that will lead to this scenario for a lower priority task and the task itself and other lower priority tasks. And this was not the case for sequential tasks. If you have some kind of conditional execution, you can always assume that you have the longest path in this sequential task and that's enough to overbound the interference of this sequential task that calls on the lower priority tasks and then also the scenario for, uh, for itself. So, because for parallel tasks, different scenarios lead to different cases of interference and there is no way that you can identify in the general case that one flow eliminates the, the other. For an accurate analysis, you will have to consider all the possible combinations between the execution flows which is intractable, it's very computational expensive. So, uh, in this scenario, how could current analysis deal with conditional execution? So, as you have seen before, they could merge all the execution uh, flows together and create like a super deck. Or, there are other kind of scalability analysis that they not take in consideration the inner structure of the of the day. So they don't the placement of the subtasks uh, in the deck is not considered. They only consider parameters like the workload and the critical path. So because the analysis relies only on these on these parameters, they can pick these parameters from the different execution flows and create some artificial graph or just work with these two parameters to build um, an analysis that is safe, yet the analysis is pessimistic. And you want to try to address this, this problem. So, an overview of the solution proposed by us. We have an application which has a set of uh, execution flows. And then, you apply an algorithm over these execution flows that will convert each one of these decks of subtasks into a deck of servers. Okay? And a server in real-time systems is somehow a container for the tasks that provides some budget for the task to execute. So every time that the task is assigned to a server, it starts consuming the budget and when the budget is uh, exhausted, this task just is preempted and can only execute when a different server picks this task again. So basically transform just one model into a different model and together with a mapping rule to assign some tasks to server, it can guarantee the execution of these of his execution flows. This is just an intermediate step in the solution leading to the second part of the, the algorithm. So we have a second algorithm that will merge this bag of servers which one bag uh, of servers for each execution flow and it will merge everything together. Basically, we come up with a unique bag of servers that will guarantee that can execute uh, any of the execution flows that is taken at runtime by the application. And by applying this transformation, then you can simply have a task set that is composed by one of these um, bag of servers for each one of the applications and then you apply traditional state-of-the-art technique and you can uh, leverage the structure of the, of the graph. So let's now see in detail how this algorithm works and the definitions of server graphs. So both of the algorithms will based on a synchronous server graph which you call uh, SSG and it's basically a DAG 
that has a specific structure. And this structure means that you have segments composed of n nodes, and all the nodes in one segment are connected to the next segment. And this means that the servers from uh, a segment, in this case the second, can only start when the servers of the previous uh, segment have complete. In this case, the servers are the ones that have granted access to the, the cores. So we schedule servers, we do not schedule tasks. The tasks are just mapped to the servers. So the servers provide budget to the tasks. So they need to have a, budget, a specific budget to allocate to these tasks. And this is given in, by this first parameter in this pair, which is the budget, the execution time that the tasks uh, can take, and the number of servers in the segment. So for the first one, let's say that you have one server with one of budget, one, one time unit, and then you have also one time unit, but you have four servers and so on and so forth. These SSGs must satisfy a validity property so that they can be used to execute execution flows. This validity property simply states that all the subtasks of an execution flow must respect all the dependencies between them. So they must still respect the order that they they are formally made to, to provide the function of the application. And also, there must be enough budget for all the tasks to execute. So it's not enough that these tasks will execute in the correct order, but of course there, there is the need to have enough budget for the entire application to execute. Besides this validity, property that must be met for each one of the SSGs, you have a simple mapping rule that determines the, the annotations of the tasks to the server. This mapping rule basically just states that each server can execute only one subtask. And a subtask cannot execute in more than one server per second. So a subtask can execute, let's say, this server and this server, but cannot execute on this one and this one. So this simple mapping rule enables to, at runtime, avoid additional complexity to map the subtasks to the server. The reason for that is because all the servers have exactly the same budget. So uh, it doesn't matter to which server you assign these ready tasks because all the servers have the same budget. So it's a very simple and straightforward rule that avoids a lot of uh, cumbersome mutation and uh, complexity in terms of implementation. So having defined the, the mapping rule, the, the property that you need to verify to make the the SSG correct, you have the first algorithm that transforms each one of these execution flows in a, an SSG. And the algorithm works uh, as follows. So let's take in, consider in consideration the, the first execution flow of uh, the first task that you had before. And what the SSG, the, the, algorithm, the first algorithm does, is in the first step, it gets a set of ready subtasks from this execution flow. So when this flow is, is uh, taken at runtime, the only subtask that is available is the, the first one. What the algorithm does is for this subtask, it finds the, the minimum execution requirement because in this case you only have one task, it will pick the execution time of this task, which is one, as you can see here in this moment. So this 
So based on uh, this set and this execution time, it creates a first segment for the SSG with a budget equal to the value found in point two, and with as many servers as there are subtasks in the set one. So in this case, we have one task, so we create one server with budget equal to one. And next step is subtract this budget that was provided to the servers to the subtasks that were on set one. And then we move this subtask from the deck if it was enough to execute the task entirely in this server. If the execution flow at this point is not empty, you go back and reiterate and repeat until there is no more subtasks to account for. So if you continue to develop this the SSG for the, this specific execution flow, in a second iteration, the first task is removed from the deck, so now uh, it's black in this uh, picture. And you have four tasks that are available to, um, to execute, to be assigned to the server. You find again the minimum execution requirement, which is one, and you create as many servers as the tasks. So one budget and four servers. So this, is, this process is repeated until the, um, the execution flow is completely assigned to the server. In this case, you will result in something like this. So, this SSG, which is proven in the paper to be valid according to the properties that we have defined, has the, also the following properties. It yields optimal workload and optimal critical path. So basically, in this transformation, you don't lose anything. So there is no pessimism involved. The, the workload uh, of the task and the critical path is the same for the SSG and the execution flow itself. In a second step, we will merge all these SSGs, create for each one of the execution flows in a global SSG for the task itself. So each task can be represented by this global SSG and not by its many execution flows. So based on the SSGs computed in the, in the previous step, this new server, graph of servers will enable uh, enable to, um, to guarantee uh, the correct execution and the entire execution of um, any of the execution flow taken at, uh, at runtime. It also inherits the task deadline and the period of the, the main task. And by doing this, you convert the multi leg model into a simple parallel synchronous task model that is uh, a bit studied in the, in the literature and for which the, there is uh, some scalability tests already available and then in this case can be applied over the global synchronous server graph instead of the, its many execution flows. This um, algorithm is basically similar to the previous one and it operates uh, as follows. First, it takes the ready segments from all the CPU server graphs and finds the minimum budget among these ready segments. The ready segment is a segment that has no, uh, no Christmas uh, constraint or for which the previous segment has already finished. Then, you find the maximum number of servers among the, the ready segments found in uh, point one. 
based on the, these two parameters, finding point two and point three, it creates a new segment with the, a budget and the number of, of servers according to the values from it. Then, we again subtract these budgets from the segments. In the previous one, we subtract the budget from the subtasks. And you remove if the, um, the segment is completely contained in the new global SSG. And you iterate until all the SSGs are completely empty. So for the, the task that take as an, as an example, I didn't picture the, the SSGs themselves because it will be too long and it will be kind of impossible to read. So based on the, on the execution flow themselves, the algorithm can also can also work. So in the first iteration, you will get the three subtasks, one for each one of the execution flows, that are ready for execution. So they kind of represent uh, one segment from the SSGs of the tasks um, of the execution flows. So the, the maximum number of servers available in these SSGs will be one. And the minimum budget for them will be the minimum budget uh, among these execution flows, which is one. So we create one server with a budget equal to one. In the next step, this server is complete and the second segment of the server can start. So in this case, there are a segment with um, four servers from execution flow one, and still only one server from each one of the others, with an execution requirement of one. So the minimum execution requirement is one, and the maximum number of servers is four. That's what you create in the second in the segment. So continuing with the, the algorithm, in the end, we have a big global uh, SSG, which can execute all of these execution flows. So it doesn't matter which one of the flows is taken at runtime, the algorithm guarantees that they will be able to execute even uh, this um, SSG, given that the, the mapping rule is enforced and the validity property uh, is satisfied. So all this works at, uh, at runtime. It needs operating system support to be able to map the task to the servers and to execute the, um, the servers itself. So for this example, if you take is um, this execution path, it will launch the, it will release the first server, and this first server will be the first task that is available, and will execute entirely there. So when this task is, is completed, according to the scheduling algorithm, all these servers are released. And at this point, as the server completes, so does the this Subtask. So you have always a guarantee that there are as many servers available as the number of subtasks. So the mapping is really one to one and very simple. So these four tasks, according to the mapping rule that only one subtask can be mapped to a server of each segment, each one of them will be mapped to a different server and they will execute entirely. You don't care about the order, this one can complete first and this 10 time units after. The only thing that changes is this server, is the next segment of servers, is released only when this, the previous servers from the previous segment have all of them complete. So by doing this, uh, this, this mapping and this chain of the release of servers, 
it doesn't matter which one of the execution paths is, is taken and the time, there will be always a server with enough budget to assign to this task and to respect the precedence constraints because all the segments enforce precedence constraints between uh, themselves. So the uh, advantage of this technique is from an analysis point of view just to simplify the process and to deal with this big server, big uh, graph of servers, instead of all the decks themselves. So a property for this uh, global synchronous server of global synchronous server graph is that the critical path length of the application remains optimal. It's the same as the maximum critical path length uh, of the original execution flows. Unfortunately, the, the workload is inflated. So the workload, in the end, gets bigger than the original maximum workload. Because you also have to account for additional servers to provide enough budget. So if you take into consideration this execution flow, here at the, the second step, we have something like four servers, but we have only two subtasks. So there is budget that will be wasted. And this represents the inflation of the workload of the server. So this is the, the only pessimism that we have in the analysis. And there is some uh, workarounds that you can apply to make it tighter. But in general, there is no optimal uh, global uh, server of graphs that is able to retain the original workload. So, in conclusion, and to open a bit of discussion, this was like a uh, first attempt to explicitly model parallel tasks with conditional execution, although there, there exists a uh, scalability test that may work under special conditions, but were not designed specifically to address this kind of problem. Uh, our method, uh, everybody relies on the concept of servers for the scalability of the tasks and these servers require uh, operating system support so it's not like you can uh, take our application and apply the scalability analysis and it will, will work now there is the need to change the operating system layer just to create these notions of server and to account for the the release uh, of the servers and the synchronizations of the different servers of different segments. The algorithm too can be improved to, um, to give a tighter uh, workload. There are some, uh, some techniques that can be applied, but it was not the focus of this work. And there is also a trade-off between this value of workload and critical path meaning that you can increase the critical path uh, to reduce the workload if that makes sense in terms of scalability. So in some cases, uh, it may be beneficial to increase the critical path length to reduce the workload to put less, less um, stress uh, on the platform. So the main contribution is to uh, allow the scalability tests to be performed on the global uh, synchronous server of graphs instead of each one uh, of the execution, uh, uh, execution tools. And this uh, allows to <coughs> use and take advantage of the inner structure of the deck. So the disposition of the um, of the subtasks, in this case of the servers and the business constraint between themselves can be used in the, in the analysis because they are safe. Uh, so it would be nice to have a comparison between uh, this technique and the ones that can be applied but uh, ignore completely the structure of the, of the bank.
pieces, the photos of our future work, probably an extension to a journey. So, thank you for your attention, and if you have some questions, Time for a couple of questions. Uh, so, I, I would like to ask you a question regarding the overall approach. Uh, you have previously mentioned that to enumerate all possible flows in a graph, like uh, if you try to enumerate them, it's uh, an interactive approach. Yeah, in the beginning of the presentation. Yeah. Actually, uh, this view is supported by what? I mean, you, you have done the experiments where you have uh, analyzed the complexity. No, it's simply uh, based on practical observations. Like when you have a real application, mm -hmm. you can have like thousands of different execution flows. Just to derive this uh, execution flow, which is the task itself alone, and then you cannot forget that you have n tasks in your application, n application. And each one of the, the tasks can have like thousands of execution flows. So to get like a um, uh, accurate value of response time, like a safe one, you need to consider all the combinations of these thousands of flows from each task. Okay. I, I understand. But you don't have any kind of analysis of the complexity itself. Okay. But okay. Yeah. So, do you have, uh, in this case, the comparison of, uh, even for some trivial cases, of uh, the gain, of the performance gain, which your approach gives, compared to the, uh, let's say, simplistic generation of the possible no, no. Maybe we can uh, try that.
graph separately and try to have something for, for each of them separately. And, um, and I think I think people liked it. Actually, what, what you what didn't say is like in ECRPS, there are this year, there are two papers, one from Sanjoy and one from Marco Bertona, and they already build on that model. So I don't know, I mean, they send me the paper, I haven't read them yet. But at least they agreed with the fact that, okay, we need another model. We cannot concern this in the kind of because it's going nowhere. Yeah, it's not like the quality of the solution that it's outstanding. I would say the same. It's Our like solution has nothing really special. So the first step Pointing out this problem yeah. was really important. Okay. Okay. Because uh, it, as me, I'm outside of this. For me, the question is uh, how, how it performs uh, compared to simplistic innovation. And second, what are the overheads of creating all those uh, Servers, whatever, whatever, because clearly it's not for free. Yeah, if, you, if you have uh, enormous uh, like graphs, then probably you have an uh, enormous number of those servers. And, uh, so I would also, like, it would be also very interesting to see the yeah. overhead distribution. Thanks a lot. Another question? Yes. Uh, let's say you're taking this Eve branch, right? And then, uh, yeah, yeah, and then you're saying, okay, uh, uh, OpenMP is responsible to run every iteration like a separate entity, like separate thread, right? You can write, you can run four iterations in parallel, right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, the question is, if there would be some kind of dummy loop such that the first, the second iteration depends on the first iteration, so you cannot run four iterations in parallel. So the question is, I mean, some, yeah, yeah, so, uh, you, like this from the task itself? Yeah, yeah, so within the That's form, not the definition of back. Yeah, yeah, I, I see. So basically, uh, the, the assumption is that uh, it shouldn't be, uh, the situation no, shouldn't be. Uh, there is no cyclic on the, on the, on the graph. Okay. It's like, it's, uh, like in real life, this is because you have to have like bounded loops and so on, it's one of the fundamental requirements of the uh, real time program okay. you cannot have this kind of behavior. Okay, so do, do you assume that it's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's like this. Mm -hmm. it's like this. Any other question? Then I will put one question here. I mean, um, what if you cannot um, at the first stage enumerate the number of uh, potential DAX. I mean, to be able yeah, to. That, that's uh, that's a good point uh, because like nowadays all these tools that you have for the worst case execution time analysis, like the rapid systems, FSIT, and so on. Well, these tools they work fine for sequential tasks, but they are not prepared to address parallel tasks and uh, multi core and so on. There is still a huge gap to, uh, to derive these, uh, all these uh, graphs in a, in a proper way. So, of course, there is still a lot of work uh, to do. But even if you don't have like, the, the exact graph, you can have some kind of approximation and like uh, a partner in the PSOCAT project, like uh, ESC, uh, they have like the, Open, they take care of the OpenMP uh, open language as a set of it, like a new compiler and so on, and they are able to derive like um, a graph for the entire application. So based on this information, you can extract our uh, set of execution tools, our set of tags. So it's possible, might not be the exact one, but uh, approximation is still there. Okay, if no more question, then you will thank the speaker once more, once more and uh, let's see you in two weeks for another session.